Okay, so we can start. Hello, everybody. I am uh, Eleonora Vittorini Orgias. I am an artist and a, a restorer and a conservation scientist. I want to uh, thank um, Mohammed and the uh, ICOM uh, for inviting me to to make this conference, to coordinate this conference. Uh, today uh, is the second appointment with um, um, with um, um, with the ICOM. And um, uh, on June, we, we did a conference um, in Italian with Italian uh, restorers and Italian artists. And today, this conference is in English. And we have uh, restorers and artists that um, speak about uh, a team uh, and that, um, mm, well, we are four and everybody will uh, speak about um, an issue, an argument that uh, we, we studied a lot in these years. And especially this conference is today is dedicated um, to Sri Lankan colleagues on the uh, 132 32nd National Archaeology Day. Archaeology Day. Uh, so today we um, will okay we will talk about art and architecture in in Italy. Uh, actually, we uh, choose some um, some uh, specific uh, issues. Well, I start with um, an, um, with uh, an argument on restoration. So I will share my screen. Okay. And I start with my presentation. Okay. Well, we, we are recording this conference because after that you can uh, see this, uh, uh, this conference on uh, a link on YouTube. Well, um, today I'm, well, I, I told you that I am a restorer and um, conservation scientist. I am a restorer of uh, sculptures, mosaics and uh, wall paintings. And today I want to talk about uh, principles of restoration methodology. Well, when we talk about uh, the restoration, we have to talk about um, a specific methodology that we have to uh, follow. Uh, actually, um, the first step that you have to follow when you want to restore um, cultural heritage is historical artistic research. So if you want, if you have to um, um, make a research in uh, historical artistic research on artworks, uh, well, it's um, it, it's um, right to, um, to follow uh, some specific points. Well, the first step is uh, to search news about artwork. So um, the date um, of, of the artwork. Uh, so I don't know if this artwork is made in um, 15th century or maybe later uh, and who uh, is the um, author of this artwork uh, the kind of the artwork so if the artwork is a sculpture or a painting uh, well the, every um, everything that uh, can um, can um, tell us the kind of artwork and news about artwork so the second step is to do um, a pre iconographic analysis. Pre iconographic analysis is um, what I see in this artwork. I don't know if it's a painting, okay, uh, there is a landscape or it is a portrait, um, everything that you can see when you see an artwork uh, at the first see. Uh, the third step is um, iconographic. Uh, descri description. So uh, I don't know the, the meaning. Uh, sorry, if you have a microphone on, uh, well, you have to. Okay, I try to. I try to take uh, put off the the audio, the microphone of everybody. 
Okay, thank you. Um, well, the third step is iconographic description. So the meaning of um, the artwork, uh, the meaning that the artist wants to transmit uh, in the artwork. So I don't know if we um, see a nativity or if we see a lamentation. Uh, what is the meaning, iconographic meaning? Um, well, the, the, the next step is visual code analysis. So uh, visual code analysis is, um, I don't know, an, um, to analyze the, the light or the, or the color or the um, or ge geometric description of the, of the artwork. So uh, every sign that, are, uh, that artists use to, uh, to, to transmit the meaning of the, of the, um, of the artwork. Uh, after that, we can uh, find a news about biography of the artist and at last is historical and cultural context of the artist. So I don't know if we are in the, in the Renaissance or in the medieval times and so. Well, if we have to do an historical, uh, historical artistic uh, research on pigment or artistic technique, uh, we have to make a specific research uh, about artistic name. So I don't know if um, I have to research something about a greener, for example, uh, the artistic name. So I don't know if um, in the... Um, in 13th century, maybe the green earth um, could um, be nominated in a different way from today. And so, uh, or maybe using history. I don't know if uh, the green earth was used in wall paintings or in uh, paintings on canvas, uh, technical um, characteristics or geological chemical characteristics because you know pigments uh, in in the past uh, were, were um, natural pigments for so from from earth, from earth uh, diffusion and commerce so where we where we find um, the pigment and the commerce so where we find the pigment um, in in the, in the world in, in yeah in the in the past world of course well, restoration um, it is important if we have to make restoration uh, during our um, artistic and historical research. It's very important to uh, find news about conservative history of the artwork. And also, it's important to know if uh, there are previous, uh, pre um, yeah, previous re restoration works. So if in the past the, the artwork was, uh, was restored yet. Um, well, in this case, we, we see an artwork in Spain and this, um, this old restoration was a disaster. And this is very famous, this, uh, this event. Okay, where we uh, could um, make um, historical research. Um, first of all, um, we we have to um, we have to follow scientific criteria and uh, traceability of writing and documents, and where uh, in library and in archive, usually. Well, start points of um, a historical uh, artistic historical research are historical sources. Uh, what are historic, uh, historical sources? Uh, the treaties, so originals or commented editions. Uh, actually, also after the treaties, we can um, read a, a specialized literature or restoration publications. Well, um, I, I just um, wrote an uh, artistic uh, treatise, but Italian artistic treatise, okay, uh, in, in the past, because, uh, yeah, we have artistic treatise also in, in the 15th century. Well, a good historical research is necessary to understand the line of restoration to, to follow. Um, actually, um, it's, it's very important um, in, in historical research um, because um, it's important um, for, for, for studying the, uh, the technique of the artwork and to study the state of conservation. 
uh, and uh, it's very important because we have to understand how to carry out the restoration respecting the historical and aesthetic uh, nature of, a, of an artwork. Well, uh, after that, after an historical and, and uh, artistical uh, research, the second step are scientific analysis. Uh, the scientific analysis are, um, are very useful in the restoration before and during the interventions. Uh, sometimes they are, um, they are also useful in the same historical artistic research because maybe um, they, um, we, we can understand better uh, something um, else with, with the scientific analysis during our historical research. And uh, they are also um, necessary after restoration for maintenance of the, of the artwork. Analysis could be chemicals or physics. Uh, so for example, microchemical analysis or optical and electronic microscope or um, analysis with uh, IR, UV and X-rays or photographic investigations. Well, targets of um, scientific research are identifying characterized chemical elements, identifying characterized organic and inorganic substances, and investigate micro and micro, uh, microstructural aspects. Well, techniques can be qualitative and or quantitative. So if we, uh, we want to know how many, how, how much, uh, or uh, what kind of, of, of substance as I, I have in an in a, in artwork. Um, okay, uh, the uh, scientific analysis could be uh, non-invasive investigations if I, can, uh, if, if I don't touch uh, the, the, the artwork. Uh, they uh, can be uh, invasive investigations, so with, with sampling. Uh, the destructive, micro-destructive and non-destructive analysis, or um, they, they can be uh, specific like invasive and non-invasive or imaging investigations. Uh, and, and actually in this case, we, we have, I don't know, like a photographic in, um, analysis, so they are not invasive. Well, at the end, we can um, say that uh, technical observations of the work uh, is, is, is the most important for a restorer. Uh, near vision and um, is, is, is the very important for a, for a restorer. Um, well, the uh, third and the last step is the restoration. So after our um, uh, historical uh, research and after our, our scientific analysis, we can do restoration. Um, and um, we, we have to follow a specific methodology uh, because we have to respect a physical and um, physical aspect, historical aspect of the artwork and aesthetic aspect. Um, because the, the, the purpose of a restorer is to pass on the future, is, is, the, the, it is to maintain the artwork for the future generations, you know. So, um, well, um, it, it is a little different, uh, the restoration of the contemporary, uh, contemporary artworks, um, because um, they need a specific uh, theory of restoration. The debate is still ongoing because um, sometimes the uh, artists, the contemporary artists, uh, don't want to restore their, um, their, their artworks. So it is um, a little different from the usual uh, theory of restoration. Well, the restoration can, um, we, we, we can restore any type of, uh, of artworks. So um, I know um, like um, a painting on tables and canvas or mural paintings, sculptures, mosaics, um, uh, works on, on metal, works on ceramic, archeological works or mummies, um, works on paper or on textiles. Uh, very different. Okay, um, 
when we talk about restoration, we talk about um, a lot of operations that we can that we can do. But actually, the, um, the more important um, operations are the first, the cleaning. The cleaning that we uh, can do uh, in a in a chemical way. So with um, with substance with specific chemical substances to I don't know remove uh, some substances nocive substances on a on artwork or in a mechanic way uh, or in a physical way like with laser and um, actually um, before uh, to clean uh, an artwork we have to uh, do preliminary tests to uh, understand the better way to clean an, an artwork well the second um, operation the very important operation is the consolidation uh, because uh, it improves the cohesion and or the adhesion of um, of, of, a, of an artwork and sometimes we have to do a pre-consolidation uh, well a consolidation before the cleaning um, because maybe i don't know the, the surface is very weak well uh, another uh, point is the uh, painting retouch uh, and and it is very useful useful to correct uh, the aesthetic the aesthetic aspect of the work using color but not with but not like a painter but in a very uh, technical way in a very specific way that um, the, that we that, that we like restorers we can use protection well protection of the surface in, is usually the last step of the um, the restored work um, actually we uh, protect the, the artworks at the end of a restoration with specific um, chemical substances and yeah the documentation during uh, restoration is very important to document all the phases of the intervention of the intervention in a photographic way or in i don't know by drawing for example and we have to specify the type and the method of use of the materials the materials that we 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 that we use well, uh, the Italian theory of the restoration say that the restoration operations must be recon recognizable. Uh, well, um, if uh, what is the meaning of this? Um, if I uh, am in a short distance um, of an artwork, um, I have to uh, recognize the uh, intervention of a restoration. Uh, well, if I have, um, if I am in a, in a long distance, um, no, uh, it, um, I I um, I don't have to to see the restoration. But if I am in a short distance, uh, it's very important because um, it's very important because I know that uh, uh, that the the the, oper the, the, the artwork is um, was restored. Uh, so rever uh, reversible um, is uh, okay. We um, the restorers has have to use materials that in the future we can remove because maybe in the future we uh, can have uh, better materials. So everything that I use on the artwork has uh, to be um, reversible and uh, compatible. Compatible. Uh, well, I have to use materials that um, can fit with the artwork, that um, don't make damage uh, to the artwork. It is very important to make uh, the to, to make um, the different phases coexist and it is um, very necessary to have the different professionals collaborate in an interdisciplinary way. So like, I don't know, a restorer, uh, historic of art, or archaeologist, uh, architect it is very, very important. So after that, to finish my, my part, uh, my case studies. Well, I just want to, to talk very, very fast of my um, studies. I, 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 I choose um, two, two studies that I did when I um, during my, my degrees. Uh, well, the first study is study on pigment of green earth in the 14th century 
Toscan monochrome wall paintings. Well, actually, um, uh, okay, I had to make a, a research on this pigment uh, because um, there is an artistic phenomenon in Italy that is called um, monochrome in green earth. And it is an artistic um, phenomenon that uh, we had in, uh, yeah, during the uh, 14th century. Um, well, the, this phenomenon started at the end of um, 13th century and it finished uh, at the beginning of the 16th century. And actually we can uh, find uh, pa the wall paintings with this uh, technique, uh, actually in the center of Italy and in the northeast of Italy. Uh, so the, um, the, the, the study was to, okay, uh, I just want to know if uh, we had um, um, green earth in, in the center of Italy because this phenomenon was um, concentrated in this area. Because in Italy we have a very famous green earth in the northeast of Italy in a region that we called Veneto, but actually I just wanted to know if uh, it exists um, green earth in the center of Italy in, uh, in a region that is called Tuscany, where is Florence, uh, because in Tuscany this phenomenon of mon monochrome in green earth was very, very famous. So I uh, had um, paintings uh, to study, a world paintings uh, that is stories of saint, of, of a saint in Florence that you can see um, on the left. And uh, so the first step was to make historical and artistic research on pigment, of course, so to understand the artistic name and use in the history, technical characteristics, geological characteristics, diffusion and commerce. Um, and the second step was to make historical artistic research on the pheno or artistic phenomenon, on the monochrome in green earth. Uh, because the question was, is there the Tuscany green earth? Well, um, during my um, historical and uh, artistic research, I um, I'm, um, read a, a book, a uh, very ancient book, uh, Treaty, uh, um, that was um, a book of, uh, of a painter of the 14th century. And in this book, um, okay, uh, in this book he, uh, Okay, because I just want to uh, put off the microphone. Okay. Um, well, in this book, um, the, this painter uh, told that um, he found the green earth in Tuscany, in a, in a specific city that is called Siena. So um, I read this uh, news and I uh, make I made a research uh, in the museums in Tuscany in Siena and I found a, a sample of green pigment in a museum in Siena. So I analyzed with uh, scientific analysis this pigment of this museum and I just found after an uh, scientific analysis that uh, this pigment was not greener but was another kind of, uh, of pigment of green. Uh, so after that, I uh, just continued to, to study my, my painting and I made scientific analysis on, um, of the green, of the, yeah, green earth of the, of the painting, of the wood painting. Um, well, actually, uh, after this, uh, this kind of analysis, we don't know if the pigment was Tuscany because we didn't have, we, we didn't have a reference standard because actually uh, I make analysis, but the results of the analysis were, were negative. But actually uh, they are very important because you know, when you uh, make a um, scientific analysis, also a negative uh, result is, an, is a result. So for this reason, it's very important. So our result is that, okay, we don't have um, Tuscany standard of green earth, but it's, it's important, it's okay. So the, the, the step, the second step is to analyze the green earth of the wall painting to, to understand 
um, the prominence of this of this green earth. So just the, the pigment was only characterized geologically. But, but this is the first example of a study uh, with the historical research and scientific research together. Okay, the second uh, study that I, that I did um, for my degree was the, okay, uh, for my degree uh, was the consolidation of the stone materials. Um, I just compare new and traditional uh, experiments. I'm sorry because I just uh, okay. I just want to okay put the microphone off of the participants. Okay. Uh, okay, the consolidation of the stone material, comparing new and traditional experiments on, on Nicodemus from the lamentation over the um, dead Christ. Uh, we are in the 14th century. Well, um, I had uh, a sculpture, in this case was Nicodemus, a sculpture of a lamentation on a uh, dead Christ. And in this case, uh, I had to um, compare a new and traditional um, products, uh, consolidation products, um, because uh, the um, surface of this sculpture was very weak and um, the, they show powder powder all over the all over the surface so i just want to understand the best consolidation product to use on this sculpture so i just um, studied uh, traditional um, products and new products so um, in, in the first um, picture you can see the lamentation uh, and and the, uh, the nicodemo Okay, at the right. And the first step was the historical and artistic research on artwork and uh, historical and artistic research on the artist. Um, after that, um, I wanted to study uh, the surface and the, uh, the, of, of the sculpture to understand the, the problem, the, the conservation problem. Well, I, uh, I told that I had dusty surface, so I just want to uh, find the, um, the, the, the best product. So I made, uh, after that, scientific analysis with samples in the laboratory and scientific analysis on artwork to understand the, the better. Uh, well, I analyzed tra uh, traditional uh, products and new products on, um, the, um, back, well, in the specific way is bacterial products, products that can consolidate the, super, the surface of a stone with the use of the bacteria. And it's a very new method. I, I, wrote, uh, I wrote a book uh, last year on this issue. And um, well, based on the analysis, um, I used a specific product for the consolidation, well, the best product after my scientific analysis, of course. Well, uh, at the end, I, I um, uh, did a uh, restoration. So I just clean it and consolidate the, the sculpture. And I made um, future projects for the, the sculpture. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you for your attention because I, I finish here. So I just want to uh, talk about um, of the methodology of the restoration, the, the, the very important, the principle, the steps of the restoration. And uh, the, I would just want to talk um, of two um, studies that I do uh, with uh, where I um, could show this kind of methodology. So, uh, okay, um, well, after that, I uh, just want to invite the next, the next speaker. Uh, if you have uh, questions, please, you can um, write in the, in the chat because at the end of the conference, we can, um, we can talk uh, about our, uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, about us. Okay, so I want to invite the second speaker. The second speaker is um, Rosanna. Rosanna Fabozzi is um, um, a restore, Italian restorer 
uh, well, she is a conservation scientist like me, and um, she is the um, uh, co-director of the Jaguar Studio, an art studio in Florence, and uh, she wants to talk about mummies uh, in Italy and the, the study for restorer um, mummies in Italy. So I don't know, Rosanna, if you are ready. Okay. Yes. Hello, everyone. So, thank you for uh, for the invitation of today. It's a pleasure to be here with you and share with you my knowledge uh, about the the mummies. So, uh, a moment. I will share you. So my presentation. So, um, as um, in honor, I just say I am Rosanna Fabozzi, um, conservation uh, scientist, graduated at the University uh, of Florence, and uh, now I am the director of the Gecko Art Studio, uh, the Tizan Art Gallery and atelier uh, here in, uh, in Florence. So I choose um, the, so this topic because um, I work it, um, I was lucky to work it on, uh, on mummies. And I think it's uh, something different and uh, very, very interesting to, to listen <laughs> about this uh, topic. So um, that's why, because it's not very usual in the field of restoration, because uh, usually we think of the restoration of paintings, frescoes, uh, sculptures, but the protection and conservation can concern um, artworks uh, such as book, parchments, ceramics, but also uh, mummies. Uh, so I will tell you uh, a little um, about uh, this, uh, this word. Okay. So the term mummy uh, refers to a dead body whose soft tissues are uh, preserved for a long time in such a way as to remember the appearance of the body in life. Therefore, uh, by mummification, we mean the preservation of the soft tissues of a ba dead body over the time. The origin of the word mummy uh, comes from the Persian and means asphalt bitumen or the crystalline resin with an asphalt like appears uh, present in Asian uh, human bodies from Egypt. Uh, that was in the, um, in the abdomen and starting from the uh, medieval era up to the 19th century, it was even sold as a medicine uh, because it was thought uh, to have healing uh, properties almost uh, miraculous. So um, coming to the classification of mummies, uh, we have three uh, types, spontaneous or natural, that is they are pro produced uh, without human intervention in a favorable environmental condition to mummification, anthropogenic or artificial, uh, that is uh, prepared by man with uh, chemical surgery that made possible to preserve dead bodies or uh, soft tissues. Almost 95% uh, uh, of mummies refers to absolute, um, all the dynastic uh, Egyptian mummies. And here we are talking about the famous practice of embalming process. Finally, uh, there are the mummies where man doesn't manipulate the dead bodies directly. However, it, uh, it knows that a certain environment support natural mummification 
building uh, necropolis in certain places in order to promote this uh, process. So uh, for the, um, this last information, we deduce that there are a favorable or unfavorable habitats for putrefaction. Therefore, factors uh, linked to temperature and humidity. In fact, uh, if there are dry cold conditions, so it means low temperature and low humidity, it is a particular favorable environment for mummification and represents one of the optimal condition. So also the dry heat uh, where the temperature is high and humidity is low, uh, think about the Egyptian desert, um, it's a good, uh, a good condition for uh, the mummification. While you, humid cold can also happen to have mummification, but due to, to humid heat, the putrefaction will be very fast and therefore uh, you will have only the skeleton in about uh, two weeks. So I prepare uh, this, uh, this small diagram where, where are the different types of international mummies are inserted according to their uh, deposition environment. So we have the natural mummies on the, and the dry cold. The, there are the glacial uh, mummies. This have in common the fact that uh, they were created uh, naturally and spontaneously thanks to uh, the low temperature. Famous are those of uh, Greenlandia, of the Kilatisok site, uh, the sailors of the Franklin expedition, uh, who set up uh, out in uh, search of the Northwest Passage, the route that goes from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific through the uh, Arctic archipelago of Canada. The two ships were stuck in the ice and could no longer free themselves. The first sailors to die were buried on Iceland and uh, in the 80s, a scientific expedition opened the graves, finding uh, perfectly mummified bodies with clothes in uh, perfect conditions. Then, um, so I can tell you about uh, the, the very famous uh, Italian glacial mummies, uh, that is Ötzi. Ötzi is, uh, is known also under different names like Similaun mummy or in English, the Iceman. It was found in uh, 1991 in the Alps on the border between uh, Italy and Austria, dating back pra uh, practically to the Copper Age and Olympic. The radiocarbon dating has confirmed the age of over uh, 5,000 years. Therefore, contemporary uh, with the Egyptian mummies of the pre-dynastic era. And uh, it is an, as an example by Homo sapiens. Along with this body, we also found clothing and personal objects of great archaeological interest. And his tattoos were also, were also famous. Ötzi uh, was murdered and today is one of the most studied bodies in history. Each of his personal effects, each of his clothes, and each physically and genetic trait has been carefully analyzed thanks to the uh, state of uh, conservation of the body and uh, the equipment. We can say that generally from that period, namely Bronze Age or uh, Mesolithic, 
Uh, there are tombs without any equipment, but uh, the object of this mummy have made it possible to discover a lot of things about the life of five millennia ago, a, a period of great uh, change. Over time, analyses have taken place and thanks to the progress of technology, more information has been discovered on the Iceman. Um, thanks to the his DNA uh, study carry, uh, carried out in uh, 2008, we know that Ötzi still has living um, descendants from his paternal branch in Corsica, Sardinia, and Tyrol. So uh, insert the maternal branch of Alpine origin is extinct. Ötzi's uh, DNA also provides many clues uh, about his appearance. We know that he had brown eyes and brown hair, and uh, a lot about his health. He was a lactose intolerant and he had a predisposed, um, he was predisposed to some heart disease. We don't know uh, why someone killed him, but we don't know uh, several details about his physical condition. He was about uh, 40 years old with a weight of uh, 15 kilos, and he was one meter 60 meters tall. He had the Lyme disease, uh, which had contract after being beaten by a tick, and uh, he was also suffering for periodontitis, gallstones, and arthritis that he, he almost certainly tried to fight with therapeutic tattoos. Yet, uh, despite everything, uh, he had managed to survive or, uh, in a very hostile environment. Talking about uh, his equipment, he wore a bearskin hat, then a coat and sheep circuit, knee-led leggings in a goat leather, trouser, and a cowskin belt. The shoe had a bare and deer skin sole, a tree bark net, and an internal straw padding. All the leathers uh, had receiver carefully processing that included uh, scraping, smoking, and treatment with animal fat to make them waterproof. Over his body, he wore a rain cover or mat, um, and since his tools and weapon were worn out or incomplete, uh, it is believed that he fled from his places uh, of origin just as uh, he were running away from uh, from someone from someone. So we um, we can um, consider it let's see, as the oldest human mummy ever found in Europe, a witness to a past in which technology and culture uh, evolved little by little. So continuing to talk about uh, natural mummies, we have the Egyptian uh, mummies uh, from the prior dynastic um, and late era. There are um, burials in the desert, in the shaft tombs, where the dead was laid in a fetal position. We can see from, uh, from the picture. And, um, and surrendering by offerings then developed in the, a simple covered architecture, but the environment is always dry and the soil promotes the uh, rapid uh, drainage. So in, uh, in Italy, uh, we find some example of um, Egyptian mummies. They are preserved in uh, the Egyptian Museum of Turin. Uh, where uh, we have those coming from the pre-dynastic period or as in Egypt, 
uh, where it's a uh, prey story, um, it's uh, poorly documented and refers to the chronology of the Paleolithic and Neolithic with a duration of two or three uh, century, centuries. And those of the dynastic period reconstructed on the basis of the testimonies left by as in priests divided it into kingdoms. Um, so the succession of pharaohs uh, that goes to define the uh, different area. So the uh, pre-agnostic mummies, they are the oldest dating back to uh, 5,300 years ago. Uh, some were found in the 19th um, century and we uh, and were located in the upper Egypt, that is in the south along the Nile Valley. The body uh, was not uh, placed in, uh, in direct contact with the ground, but placed on the wicker basket or mats and covered with sheep and goat skin. Uh, this material was able to, uh, to be preserved thanks to, uh, to the dryness. The body was not then covered directly by the sand, but by a table, as uh, it, um, if to form a sepulchral chamber. The dead was surrendered by funerary offerings, such as tools, weapons, decorative containers containing food and drink, if uh, it was possible to find more or less preserved skeleton uh, and soft uh, tissues. The dynastic mummies, so they are getting back to uh, 3100 BC until the fourth uh, century CD. And we know them uh, from the Egypt campaign in the 18th century with conquest of the Napoleon uh, I. But with um, Herodotus, of Eric Arnassus. Today, we know a lot of information. He uh, lived in the fifth century and he was a great historical uh, reporter telling us the funeral rite and the embalming for the first time. So Curious is uh, in Italy, is the mummy of a little girl that was found near Rome in Grotta Rossa, uh, dating back to the middle of the second century. Uh, it was a Roman girl uh, whose body was uh, mummified without pulling out the brain and the balls, but using lime stripes with balsamic and resin sub, uh, substance, uh, so the wrapping, and uh, it was used in uh, Egypt and rarely viewed in, uh, in the Italian uh, capital. So from the analysis carried out, uh, it um, appears that the girl had various infection and suffered from uh, nutritional uh, malnutrition. The girl uh, did not belong to a poor family, but later, uh, she was a part of a Roman family, perhaps converted to the cult of the Egyptian goddess Isis. In fact, the girl's body was wrapped in a precious Chinese silk tonic and was adorned with a golden sapphire necklace. Uh, then they found an ivory doll with articulated arms and legs. So we can see here, um, so like uh, the, the modern uh, Barbies, and uh, was also found next to her body. A few jars of red uh, amber, small amulets, a small female bust also for amber, completed the, uh, the funerary equipment. So the sarcophagus, that enclosed the girl was in white marble with angular mask. We can see here in the picture 
um, was decorated with deer hunting, uh, inspired by the episode of Aeneas and Dido. In uh, mummification, one of the, the question is, um, the common question is why uh, anthropo anthropogenic mummification? What social uh, purpose did they have? So uh, the anthropogenic mummification um, has been very important for, uh, of course, for social purpose in different civilizations. And we can summarize it in uh, its value in three concepts. So uh, the first one is the uh, straightening of uh, authority. What is meaning? If we think of pharaonic Egypt, the Peru with the Incas, uh, especially in a theocracy, it was very important to bring the figure of the sovereign closer to, the, uh, to that of a god, to emphasize his div the divine nature. A classic example is that of uh, the Egyptian pharaoh who, uh, with the funeral rite, approached the figure of the god, uh, god Osiris. Still in Egypt, people go so far as to cover the entire, entire body with gold, the material from which the gods are made. Then uh, we have the affirmation of a social status. So the, the mummy was used to assert personal prestige or a social class. Mummification practice uh, were reserved for the sovereign and for the high social classes. Such practice were expensive and few called for them. And the last one is for the control of spiritual strength. Uh, there was a tendency to embalm the body to preserve his spirit from acting in an uncontrolled way, uh, which we can also find in rites without mummification. For example, in uh, as in Rome, the dead were buried with food and drink, putting in their mouth a coin that was to be used to pay the duty and the ferry to the afterlife in the underworld. So from the um, archeological evidence, it can be deduced that uh, mummification were carried out in coincidence with periods of strong social tension, which requ uh, required a strong central authority. For example, there are Asian Inca ceremonies uh, where the mummies of dead rulers were carried in procession in the same way as the statue of uh, saints are carried today. A particular category are the mummies of the saints, uh, the intact discovery of the body for the Catholicism testify to the holiness of, uh, of the dead. This is the case of the mummy of Santa Rosa in Viterbo in central Italy. The body, it's a body of a young Franciscan uh, born in uh, 1231 who died in uh, 1251 buried in the ground and after eight, um, 18 months, uh, she was exhumed for the canonization process and an intact body was uh, discovered. Uh, we can say that she was an example of a spontaneous mummy formed due to the ripe degradation. So here, there is a group of mummies. Uh, so Ferentillo, Roccapelago, and uh, Monsampolo di Tronto. They are all in uh, between Central Italy and uh, North Italy. So we, uh, we start with uh, 
with of Ferentillo, we are in Umbria, in the province of Terni, when uh, during excavation carried out in the crypt of the old church, uh, many well-preserved mummies, uh, mummified bodies appeared. Uh, there are uh, 24 mummies, which include men, women, uh, and children, as well as two mummified birds. The history of um, only some of the mummies on display is known. A particular reconstruction uh, concerned the mummies of two Asian people uh, recognized by their uh, characteristic uh, physiognomy. The legend uh, tells of a rich man and his bride, uh, probably uh, Chinese, on their honeymoon in Italy on the occasion of the Jubilee of um, 1750, after falling ill, they died in Ferentillo, um, where they were buried in the villa church. The legend is supported by the present of their clothes that, that are in good condition. Uh, there are also present mummies of young women who died in childbirth, then an old peasant uh, woman with her clothes still intact, and two uh, Napoleonic soldiers who comes to Italy during the campaign, the Italian, Italian campaign of 1796-97, uh, both showing, uh, showing uh, six of torture, and one of them was hanged. The cause of the execution uh, remains uh, unknown. Then we have uh, of Roccapelago in uh, Emilia Romagna region. Uh, it is a small community in the modern, um, so near Modena. The discovery of these mummies is quite recent. 2009-2011, uh, when here to excavation due to a restoration to the church, uh, both to light um, seven tombs with uh, multiple barriers, with more than uh, 200 bodies, including adults, children, men, women, and uh, elderly. The barriers uh, probably uh, dating back to uh, between uh, 16th and uh, 18th century. It was not as usual. Mummification of a specific social group, for example, for monks or members of um, illustrious families, but the natural conservation of an entire community allowed by the particular microclimate of the environment, uh, characterized by low humidity and intense ventilation. Not only a unique find for Northern Italy, but an authentic mine of information, an opportunity to study both human uh, rest, so human remains and clothing, and the uh, main object of the daily use. So reconstructing almost three centuries of uh, peasant life, beliefs, tradition, uh, customs, and habits uh, of the Asian mountain community. So the last group, it's uh, Monsampolo, that is a picture showing me um, by cleaning uh, the, the mummies. Uh, and we are in the Marche region in the province of Ascoli Piceno. In the, in the crypt uh, museum houses where they found uh, 20 mummies in the chapel of the good death. So during the restoration work, which took place in uh, two, um, 2003, of the Church of uh, Santa Maria Assunta, um, following um, the, the earthquake. 
So here, uh, to the, the favorable, uh, favorable conditions of the microclimate have allowed the conservation of the body and uh, their clothing made by vegetable uh, fiber. The um, exhibition is, is completed by object found during the archaeological excavation, rosaries, medals, and ex, um, ex voto. Particularly um, among uh, the mummies was a case of anthropogenic uh, artificial mummification obtained through a surgical evisceration uh, process. Except for Chibadis, all the mummies was found in uh, Monsanto di Tronto are clothed. Uh, this exceptional and unique data can tell us more on uh, the history of clothing of the working classes of the Toronto Valley uh, between the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 19th century. The, um, the clothes uh, worn by mummies belong to everyday life, even if uh, some, some garments uh, for their beauty and elegance uh, seems to refer to the category of part dress of special occasion. So the uniqueness of the find has to consist in the good conservation of the clothes in the variety of textile fiber and shapes um, typical of the popular, uh, popular class. So during the 18th century, uh, the small uh, urban cemetery of the crypt had the problem of crowning and hygiene. And uh, that is why the service were probably uh, emptied to make way for the new uh, burials and uh, the bodies mo moved in the site, uh, in the site uh, chapel. So that is another pictures made by, by me during the, um, the, the process of the restoration. Yeah, thank you for, <laughs> for the attention. Thank you, thank you, Rosanna. So if there, so if someone have questions, so can write yeah. on, the, on the chat and after we, we will answer. Yeah, at the end of the con on the conference. Yeah. Thank you a lot. Uh, well, after after Rosanna, we had we changed the the topic, so we um, we are in um, not in restoration but in the art. So I just want to invite Ivo Kotani. Uh, he is an artist. Um, he was born in the same city uh, the, where I was born. In the center of Italy, and uh, I, it, it's a pleasure to invite Ivo because uh, he is a young artist, a performer, and he has a lot of ideas. I, I follow his social, and uh, he he has a, a lot of ideas and uh, a lot of uh, events that he create uh, creates and creates and and share with us. So Ivo, if you are ready. Yes. Okay, you can share your screen and yeah. you can talk about your topic. Yes, thank you very much, Eleonora, and thank you everybody for these possibilities to share culture, art, and this, this stuff around the world. So thank you very much. And yeah, uh, I'm going to share my... Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, today, I'd like to speak about upcycling. Uh, why? Because um, it was uh, about my last research in art and my last uh, uh, exhibition. And everything starts from this place of up upcycling. Upcycling, uh, from upcycling to contemporary art. So uh, we are going to speak about this and uh, there are three words that maybe one of them we know better, that is recycling. What is recycling and what is downcycling and what is upcycling? 
So um, from there, we just have a look of what, what are the differences between these, these words and this concept and how this concept develops in themselves into the, the story and also into the art. So what is really down cycling? Is the recycling of waste where the rec recycled material is of a lower quality and functionality than the original material. So what's, what is the meaning? It's very simple. When we use something and then uh, the things will degenerate and uh, to um, institute the, the same um, object or the same material, we will waste more energy than, uh, than just then to, to bring it back, we waste uh, more energy than to use it. This is downcycling. Then there is right, uh, recycling, recycling it, that is the process of converting waste materials into new materials and objects. And uh, the recyclability of a material depends on its ability to reacquire the properties it had in its original state. So it is an alternative to conventional waste disposal that can save material and help lower greenhouse gas emission. It can, it can also prevent the waste of potential, potentially useful materials and reduce the consumption of fresh raw materials, reducing energy use, air pollution from incineration and water pollution from landfilling. So what is uh, that everyone knows about recycling that uh, a lot of governments uh, around the world are applying a lot of the recycling part to like uh, in, in some way save nature and to protect our future. Uh, and so this, this concept, uh, we know really well this concept. But then we have the upcycling part. So upcycling, part, part, uh, upcycling is the opposite of downcycling, which is the other part of the recycling process. Um, most recycling involves converting or extracting useful materials from a product and creating a different product or material. So the fact is this, um, with upcycling, we um, don't go in a li linear path, but uh, we can extrapolate something from you, uh, material that we used and create something different. So, yeah, and uh, this, uh, this is about entropy. Why entropy? Entropy is the measure of disorder of a system or energy unavailable to do work. Why? Because uh, every time we have a product, we manage something and we create something, we use energy. And the fact is that uh, the entropy part is that we, to, to go back in the process, we will use more energy than to do the process. So this is like a law in the universe. And it, it, about um, this topic, upcycling, there is the, the first man who talked about it was Reinhard Pils um, in this article that is like thinking about a green future. Because he uh, first uh, says this, he was uh, an engineer that uh, one of, of the first person who start to use like uh, um, unconventional material to create uh, um, stuff like interior designer and stuff like that. So he said this, recycling, he said, I call it downcycling. They smash bricks, they smash everything. What we need is upcycling, where old products are given more value, not less. Yes, and so this, this concept can bring us to three different economy. There is the linear economy, the waste economy that we can see here, the, the, the first drawings. There is then the recycling economy. That it, it's like um, to go um, not too fast to, to waste stuff, but then you have always to waste stuff. And there is the circular economy that depends on upcycling. So the linear economy is about take, we take materials, we make something, we use it, and then we waste it. 
in the recycling economy, we take materials, so we make something, we use it, and then we have the option to recycle and then use recycle, but at a certain point, we have to waste it. In the circular economy, uh, there is not waste. There is only like making some object, use it and reuse, repair, recycle or return. So it's this creation with always that is the same uh, creation uh, of the natural because the circular economy comes from the economy of natural, the ecosystem. Because if it's true that uh, it's rarely possible to go back to initial states or very difficult, it is also true that um, the natural tend to cause and allows the creation of new possibilities and continuous search for the new. So uh, in uh, natural, there is not this concept of wasting because natural don't do rubbish. So it's, it's like only a um, uh, human concept. And for this, upcycling is like a point of view to look in a different way, the possibility we can live produce and act in our lives. So why this and how we can go, uh, from here go towards art? Now uh, I'm going to, to show you some projects. There are a lot of projects all around the world uh, that starts from this idea of upcycling and uh, there are a lot of corporate projects. One of them is Freitag, it's a company founded by the mind of designer Marcus Freitag, who started by producing bags made from old trucks tarps. So uh, these guys, when they are very young, uh, start to think about this. We can use these tarps, very big tarps, uh, tarps of old truck that uh, will be wasted and is also plastic and it, it can really, um, it's not good for nature and make it for like uh, bags. And now the bags also are sold like a good price. So, and then there is another project that I selected between a lot of them that I was a sari. I was a sari is a project, uh, we can say Italian, Italian Indian project uh, by Stefano Funari that in uh, 2011 uh, visited Joe Bazaar one of the largest second-hand markets in India. And this brand is based on creative reuse of old saris to create new uh, accessories with modern design. So it's very, very easy like concept. Uh, they just um, recall uh, a lot of stuff, a lot of old saris, and then they recreated something different. And another project, always Italian, is Sara Daboni, uh, that is a company, textile company. And uh, from, uh, they create like uh, pigments uh, from textile fibers obtained from used clothing and production waste. So uh, they just um, collect a lot of <clears throat> fibers from this clothing and then they, um, they can obtain pigments and these pigments can be used to color other and future clothes and uh, and furniture this is in the corporate thing and then uh, the this this part of upcycling is uh, in the culture of all over the world in all ancient culture, uh, recovery and transformation was a discounted idea because especially in the textile sector, the concept of waste was not present. And in the pre-industrial societies um, that are born before con consumism. So uh, this like obviously because uh, they, they tend to use everything, uh, sometimes also for the level of poverty that there was. And uh, so this concept is after the industrial society. And why the, the, this became also inspirational for modern artists? Because if we just have a look to these pictures, to these, uh, yeah, these pictures, uh, we can just see some of modern art that I put after here, like Paul Klee and Pete Mondrian. 
in that period, like uh, a lot of uh, oriental objects, uh, oriental stuff uh, came in Europe and a lot of artists can see this, these products and a lot of artists have inspiration from that. So if we just look at this picture, there are two paintings, one of Paul Klee and the other one, well, Pete Mondrian, we can see the similarities with this textile reuse of a lot of culture. So just having a look of this one, we can see that it's very similar to Pete Mondrian and also from this, the Paul Klee. Now I have just, uh, um, there are a lot, a lot of typolo typologies uh, and I've, I've taken six. The Crazy Kills, um, uh, much more frequent, uh, the use of pieces of, of exotic fabrics for the time, such as a velvet, satin, tulle, or silk. And the application of decoration, such as buttons, lace, ribbons, beds, uh, or embroidery. Hours for composition of a single kilt. So it's like this collage of a lot of texture all together. And then there is in Cor Korea, Jokabo, that it's a recovery textile technique in the pa packaging fa fabric used through to. The result is a patchwork that, uh, I said before, is a reminiscent of the artistic production of Paul Clay and Pete Mondrian. And uh, in other culture, there are a lot, in all the culture of the world, uh, in Chinese, uh, there is jeba, is an ancient practice of a making textile collage. There is this homogeneous surface made from pieces of clothes that were, were glued together with uh, rice glue. And uh, the product is to um, use to stuff show um, like like the soles of the of the shoes. And then we have also uh, bouchurette uh, that is discard the garments that are shirts of blankets and are like fabrics cut into strips, very long strips that had uh, dimension that they had, could be used both for creating the structure of a carpet. Also in Bengali, there are Beng Bengali women uh, that produ produce kanta, kills and pillows as a way to reuse discarded textile with protective qual qualities because in all the, this culture, there is di like this, this thing about that the, the fabric are, can, is capable of carrying emotions and can feel like a warm embrace full of memories. And also in Kaudi, there is this type of kilt. So the local women is making Kaudi from their fam families, uh, Suceris, and uh, like uh, also there, there is this sentiment, sentimental value. So going, oops, going, yeah here just a moment i've done something okay here here so in other culture like there is uh, this other example of kin kintsuji uh, that literally means repair with gold and is a restoration uh, technique that is from japan and uh, in the late uh, in, in Japan, potters to, to repair ceramic cups for the ceremony of tea. Uh, one theory about the creation of this uh, technique was that um, in the past, uh, there, there was this shogun, Ashikaga Yoshimasa, that uh, sent a damaged Chinese tea bowl back to China for repairs. And when it was returned, repair with ugly metal staple, it may have promoted Japanese craftsmen to look for a more aesthetically pleasing means of repair. So they start to repair uh, this, uh, this pottery with gold. And this is just an, another example how to show how, how is upsizing. So we can have like an object that usually is wasted and uh, by re reuse, and uh, upcycle that object, we can create some, something that has more value. 
And uh, other other examples are the worst towers that uh, was made that they are in Los Angeles and um, are like a collection of 17 sculpture towers. They are architectural structures and the entire sites of towers, structure and sculpture um, are designed by Simon and Sam Rodia that are Italian immigrants and uh, the, this, this uh, installation are very, very big. And th there is one of the first installation that was made from this, this idea of upcycling. But now we can go in the modern art. And uh, here I'm talking about collage. And he, I talk about this like hidden upcycling because um, the collage, uh, as we know, is a technique that was adopted in the 20th century for the creation of uh, uh, of some work, of artistic work, and uh, the main exponent of that were Braque and Picasso. Um, and from them uh, starts like this use in art of materials of, uh, that, that we can find around us is always present. And uh, start also the polymater polymaterism uh, with the futurism and abstract geometric tendency. And also the Dada movements uh, and the pop and the nouveau realism use a lot of uh, collage. So the fact is that artists in the story always use uh, materials that they can find around them so that they can like uh, build their, their, their project. And the fact in art is that uh, th there is not a good or bad um, object or material to use. There is only materials that you can use to make something build and to make something greater. And this collage is a real example of that. So talking about upcycling and modern art, uh, we can say that uh, also uh, intellectually upcycling uh, starts with Duchamp and the Dadaist. Uh, we know about the bicycle wheel or the fountain that are made in the first of nine, 19. And uh, also there is uh, Pablo Picasso with bull's heads that is made uh, with a discarded bicycle saddle and hand handle bars. And uh, also we have another exponent that use uh, collective trash that is Rosenberg, and uh, there is these three examples also here that we can see in these pictures. So, from upcycling to contemporary art, we have seen now upcycling. What is upcycling? We have seen like uh, how corporates and industries use upcy upcycling. And we have seen the modern art and now we are going to dive into contemporary art. And it's like the feel rouge of this conversation, conversation is about seeing how the artistic way of producing is really near the point of view of nature, of uses all materials to create something different, to look at some different possibility and uh, that can apply also in our societies, maybe in the future. We have uh, the Shanbel phenomenon that uh, I, I, I named this art beyond ethics because the fact is that um, the artistic path of upcycling is not a lot of times starting for the concept of upcycling but is like intrinsic in the artistic creation. And with this, uh, with this uh, artist, we can like have more clarity about this concept because it was, he said, it is always a kind of experiment. Also nature is always a kind of experiment. So natural experiments and grow and, and creates new possibilities. And also art, as so Schnabel uh, with his plate paintings, um, he produced starting from uh, the shards of ceramics plates in the 80s. Um, and uh, he started creating this object of 
neo-expressionist art. And uh, in his uh, artwork, uh, Ryu's is recurring. And uh, there is like, uh, he, he made this, uh, um, this uh, exhibition in New York with uh, 13 paintings rendered on a large recycled cotton covers. Uh, which the artist himself had bought from some fruit stands in Mexico. Um, and uh, he said, it, all, it is always a kind of an experiment, he admitted. What can I use? He asked. How can I find or make a sign that gives give me a change, a chance, a, excuse me, a chance to see something else? How will the paint be positioned on the material? So the point of view of creation is really like exper experimenting, looking for something different. So how can I paint, in this case, um, a ceramic place? How will be this sign on this typology of canvas? Oops, uh, another time absent something, excuse me. Just a moment. I don't know what happens, so I'm just looking. Here, yeah, okay, here we are. Yeah, so we are here and now going in uh, with this new artist, he's a contemporary artist, Hazume from Benin, that is, was very famous for his plastic canisters. So he um, remo uh, remodeled uh, American masks with some spray painting and other adorned with feathers, pipes, brushes, and even a broom. Um, the, he, he used this recycled plastic to create like uh, illusions, uh, allusions to Yoruba masks that was used in past in religious rituals and ceremonies as a symbols of identity, even confer nobility of an object used of, for illegal purpose, the reuse of which has allowed Hazume to be appreciated as an original and innovative artist, artist all over the world. And then we have another artist that is Jan Barry. Jan Barry, he reproduces, he reproduces scenes of everyday life chosen with a gaze influenced by cinema and magazine photos. He reproduces the subway, women sitting in minimal and elegant, elegant houses and some portraits. And we can see like here, him uh, that is standing with a lot of uh, clothing, jeans clothing. And here in the back, in the, here we can see uh, his artwork. And uh, all of he, his artworks are made with- uh, uh, Excuse me, yeah. I, I would just, so your slides are not changing here. Yeah, Ivo, because um, we, we see the same, ah. yeah, the same page. We are uh, stopped in the plate paintings, art and ah, Okay. So, oops, just a moment. I don't know what's happened. Like, maybe you can stop the share your screen and and start it again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a moment. Huh? Okay. 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 Nuova condivisione. Ah, okay, yeah. What's now that? I see your, okay. No, excuse me, it's like. Now, you, what, it's functioning? Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, we, 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 yeah, okay, it works. Yeah. Okay, we, okay. I, Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was talking about this guy, Azume yeah. from Benin, okay. that he makes these um, uh, th these artworks 
uh, that are like Yoruba masks that was used for religious rituals and ceremonies. But these masks, these masks, how can you see, are made from uh, plastic canisters that often used to illegally transport gasoline from Nigeria. So he took this plastic and he, he creates artworks from these. And he is now really an appreciated and original innovative artist around the world. And this is like a way artists use uh, materials to create their stuff because always in every time in the in story, artists always use some materials uh, uh, that ha they have near like uh, in the past uh, there is all, only charcoal stuff or some pigments and the artists use that so a lot of times the art is made from that which the artist can find around him and it's this process that for me is really an inspiration like the natural works so we can go and then I was speaking about Jan Berry, that is young uh, artist that produced a lot of uh, art pieces that are made with uh, cloth and with jeans. So he, uh, he collects a lot of jeans that they have to, uh, to, to, to go to the rubbish. And uh, with these jeans, he, um, he creates and cuts thousands of thousands of small pieces and then he creates this, this wonderful masterpiece because really like this one is created only by jeans. And then there is another artist, uh, uh, Young Koji, can, that uh, make animal statues by putting pieces of old tires together. So uh, this, this, art, this artist is uh, really no, uh, renowned for his macabre and black sculptures of hybrid creatures made from silvers of upcycled tires. And uh, he fantastically reimagined and imbued with the intensity and stylization that came from video game graphics. And a lot of times he created these strange and fantastic animals like sharks, um, wolves, that exude a humanoid sentient and hostility. So also the materials that uh, now the artists are available with this concept of upcycling are different. And also the, the same works of the artists assume uh, um, a feeling, a different feeling. So it's very different if you have to use in your artistic way um, a plastic from tires or a different color. And, uh, and this is like, like allowing to the art to be really different all around the world. And then for the last one, I may, mm, I put myself here because I also use um, a lot of uh, materials from uh, upcycling. Uh, I use modern and ancient fabrics, silk and clothes for the creation of my work. So I just use these clothes that uh, a lot of shops, they go to, go to waste them, but they are very good clothes. And I use them to create my, my own my own artwork and uh, for me i say here art is an unstoppable chaotic and natural movement for the continuous creation of new possibilities i call it uh, art without limits that is like boundless art see everything is good and uh, is uh, is is like this way of art to bring in always something new and so uh, this is like the topic and is thank you very much for everyone. And uh, yeah, I've finished. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ivo, because it's, it's very interesting, your, your topic.
really and i think that that is also a little unusual but um, well um ivo is an artist and also the next speaker is another artist uh, they also um organize lessons if i uh if i don't make a mistake if i make a mistake you can correct me but actually i i know that you organize lessons on online lessons also for foreign people so yeah. if you want you can uh, evo and the next speaker octavio um can put the uh their contacts on on the chat so if someone is interested can contact you it's okay hello Okay, so the next speaker is Octavio. Octavio Palomino is um, a sculptor and uh, the director of the Gekwar studio. Uh, Octavio studied in, in Italy here in Florence, the sculpture. Uh, and uh, today he, he wants to speak of, uh, of a topic uh, of a um, of topic uh, about sculpture, of course, uh, the Florentine method for the sculpture. And so, if okay, if Ivo uh, can stop the condivision, the, the the sharing to to sharing screen, Octavio could uh, share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I have to. So Octavio, you also you are in a sculpture, but you also. Uh, organize uh, lessons or sculpture lessons for for people you know okay yes that's it um, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this uh, this conference thank you too um, so if you want after at, at the end of the conference if you want to write the, your contact to to in, in the chat so if people is interesting to your lessons can text you it's okay at the end of the conference Okay, so um, if you, okay, great. We are seeing your desktop. Okay. So, can start. check if I put the, okay, the full screen. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Eleonora. Um, as you say, I'm a sculptor. I, um, I studied sculpting, uh, sculpture for a couple of years in Peru, in Lima. And then I take the decision to get a degree in Italy, in Florence. So that is the reason I moved here. I really focus into figurative sculpting. Um, so practically, I'm, I'm going to try to explain my favorite part, the reason that I consider that the, um, the people can look to Florence for, uh, for this uh, the idea of the traditional and uh, Florentine method. So for example, for um, first of all, uh, let's consider the, um, the system now. So we consider the possibility to add material and remove material. Uh, in considering the clay, the clay as a original uh, process, or the, or the, the most basic process with clay, with the, or, um, the uh, water-based clay, and then uh, that uh, create the figure, create the, the forms in that process. No? But then we have the, the removing, so the subtraction the material, no, and we we can con we can consider the marble, the stones with the direct direct sculpting uh, for that materials, no. Well, in clay, it's it's possible to get the permanent hardness like the other materials that we mentioned, but uh, it needs a process like a firing, no. We get the terracotta. So normally the masters get in this uh, more, more um, practical exercise or reproduction with clay and then the terracotta market, like the base to create the other figures in uh, different other materials. But as a principal material like terracotta is, is really recognized like an artistic 
final uh, presentation. So since the ancient time in has been a human being an, uh, a need to reproduce the nature. So that that the, the necessity to reproduce the nature, reproduce the the everything around create, well, we can consider the Venus, the prehistoric Venus, you know, the first representation, one of the, the, the representations that we can we are talking about the sculpting. So slowly the um, the process, the humans start to getting into new technology. So the material discover how they can, with the instruments, create the um, force the materials into the figures that they want. But the difficult problem is how can I reproduce the nature? You know? So my eyes see that, but I need to represent it with a different material because we are talking about um, uh, difference, like like uh, fleshy skin or uh, flowers or these elements of the nature. The humans need to represent, and they really get into the technique to how to transfer that elements into the into the clay or the other different materials. No, so in that case, um, this increase of the knowledge and discovered materials, we can jump into the Renaissance. And into the Renaissance in Florence, practically, we are talking about Florence, we, um, everything born, right? So uh, this period in, for the sculpting is uh, really a band garden, art, art. So practically is the, the, all the artistic forms getting into a really solid uh, representation. So, so um, for mention some names, my favorites, and I consider the most important is Donatello and Filippo Brunelleschi. So um, that, uh, that masters create a really, really amazing representation, but definitely, um, they get inspired from the other, the ancients uh, generations, not the ancients uh, cultures. So practically Donatello, uh, we can consider one of that. Uh, sorry, I missed this one. This is uh, the picture of uh, terracotta made it by me. Um, this is a portrait, represents some kind of Greek and uh, but at the same time, I used uh, the face of a friend. So this is uh, one of the process using this the uh, the water-based clay, right? So then continue. So Renaissance, we are talking about Renaissance. Donatello. So Donatello, uh, he created that. Uh, for example, at the right, at the left side, we can get uh, Saint George. Uh, at the Bargello. So that representation create uh, the figure, the human figure, and is so balanced, so um, structured, like someone say that if you can draw it, it continue in the same piece because it's so solid representation of contraposto. That is a, one of the ways that the tradition uh, represent the figure, the human figure, right? Okay, and the other side, in the right side, we have a Filippo Brunelleschi. So that representation is uh, the, the binding of Isaac. So that was part of a competition that he practically get, uh, but uh, it's a nice history about that because uh, at the end he don't don't win this competition, so he moved it practically. I consider like according with the history is that he moved into Rome and then start to push himself to study more about uh, Rome civilization because uh, he 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 don't get into this competition. Okay, but. 
So the, um, if we continue moving into that, uh, we have uh, Donatello. And this representation of uh, Penitent Magdalena, so in the Museum of the Doll. So look at that figure, you can see the position of the feet. And that representation is really a sufferance into the face. And we can see the other one in the other side, the Siderio di Settignano. One of my, uh, consider, I consider the Siderio di Settignano is practically a, the, the one of the origin, uh, original masters that create many other, other many of the techniques that the the other big names use it. You know? and then we have the same uh, representation, but in his style. And then we have another. So definitely, we talk Italy and uh, Florence specifically. We need to talk about David. This uh, the the depiction of David, no, the biblical fight. This biblical fight practically it was uh, represented for uh, many artists. And um, yeah, we can see uh, Donatello's David. It's amazing, the body representation. You can see the naked figure that is, uh, is really unproportionate. And uh, you can recognize the gesture, right? The contrapost to use it, this balance. Oh, sorry. And in the right side, we have Barocchio, that he um, he represent uh, uh, David, but with the clothes, with the pipe, he have uh, the head in, under the feet and the, the sword in the hand. So, that uh, with clothes, this is the difference. We, you know, the Donatello uh, made one a really amazing figure with a naked body, and we have the difference with the clothes. You know? And then we have the maximum uh, expression, maximum expression of the master uh, classical technique, that is the David of Michelangelo. Uh, so, this marble practically was created using a maquette and then uh, he used milk. Reducing the quantity of the milk, he started to see more parts of the, of the maquette. And that part that he couldn't see um, remained into the figure. And then the other part, he started sculpting. So, practically, uh amazing many this uh, marble was even a, a waste practically not not used for years and he take it the challenge to create that you know so let's continue into the um, uh, into the historical thing for example this marble was considered the top, and then we can try to move into the idea of uh, mannerism. Um, what we can say about mannerism? So we, we stay in one stage, like these masters take it all the knowledge of the ancients and create that representation. No? And now the artists create a kind of excessive uh, technical representation. So what we are talking about, we are talking about that uh, those muscles that you can see are not real, are not possible that a human person can have it, that uh, they created it. So that was the reason that is called manier, is in my own manier, maniera, that my own way that interpretate the rules. So not necessarily following the rules that the original masters that they represented the nature, the figure, the humans, but they exaggerate, they use it more than that, you know? The artist uh, that the norm of the rules that they usually have it. So for example, they, we have into the, into the, the left, we have a Benvenuto Cellini, Dr. Seuss, and then in the right, we have uh, Bacchio Vandenelli. He made the Hercules. 
So, and CAC. So, practically, we, we get that new tendency, that new representation. And one of my favorites is Gian Bologna. So, why? We can consider that the classical modeling using the rules, and then these artists create the new, and no, in some way they consider and classical, no? But is uh, taking that and then exaggerate, force it, and getting more. This conventional started practically in 1520s with the death of uh, Raphael, you know? And that uh, this manier, this new free language, really, really create a, a new language into the Italian classical style, no? So, uh, at this point, we can consider uh, different types of this representation. You know, these mythical, these uh, exaggerated figures like uh, allegories. In that case, we have the another interesting like is the, the this fontaine, fontaine you know, this, uh, this fontaine from Gian Bologna. Okay, and then we have, what we have here? We have a representation of the Neptune and the rivers. So practically the different rivers pouring the, uh, the water to create the representation of the force and the the idea of the ocean. No? So that, that fontaine, that fontaine, we have um, okay. Let's go for the depth. We have a one representation of that rivers here. I practically modeling this using the historical uh historical reference no so that representation is using that exaggeration this uh mannerism no octavio we we see only the the live demo it is correct okay, okay let's close that okay okay great perfect and yeah, let's continue with that. So talking about this representation, what material, I use the new materials now. So this is a resin reproduction, definitely the one of the original from uh, Gian Bologna. He usually used um, uh, terracotta for those size, this size. And this is uh, with acrylic paint, a tinet. So for this process, I can show the basic part, like the structure. So as a part of the new materials, I have uh, this wire, like uh, this is aluminum wire, easy to modeling, getting the figure, catching the gesture. So what we, uh, what we try is to using that like a support, internal support. When we have the process of terracotta, we remove this internal support carefully cutting by slices. So we rebuild again, but internally needs to be empty because otherwise uh, the fire will create an explosion because the bubbles inside of, uh, of air, you know? And continue talking about the new materials. I have a oil-based clay. The sculptors now using this. This oil-based clay is the bay, is, um, is part of the process for the river god that I have it, you know? 
So as you as you see, this practically looks like wax. And in the in the old days, when they create the wax version, they put it into the process for the foundry and then using bronze. So that more or less could be the process for this piece. And then the getting the final result like in a bronze or in my case i normally use the new material like a resin for a practical uh, and, and not necessary because you know the materials is important using the idea of uh, shipping or getting uh, in the different because the heaviest and especially that okay so practically that's it i continue the tradition to copy the nature using my own rules but following the uh, the master uh, the, ma the old master's technique the this technique practically is what the florentine is proud you can see this art around florence and uh, my studio gecko art studio have a uh, the possibility to take these lessons. Okay, so that is all, Eleonora. So, yeah, any questions, maybe? Uh, I can hear. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So, yeah, I just want to thank you for uh, your intervention, for this historical view um, on the, the Florentine technique of the sculpture. So, yes, I am. Um, Okay, we actually we ah, okay, so we have finished, but actually I think that uh, there is a question for mm -hmm. you. Yeah, uh, Ditya, if I okay, uh, well you you have you have to put the microphone on. Oh, okay. I... Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, how are you? Hi. I'm fine. How are you? How's everyone? You, you well, <laughs> from, um, you have just more piercing from the <laughs> respect the last time that I see you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a question for okay. Dan. Is that what uh, you spoke about mannerism? It's very beautiful, like how mannerism gets incorporated into sculptures. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's out of a general knowledge I had happened to read long time back, you know, so I want to ask you, like, what do you think about the great castration, which happened in 1857 when Pius IX, he took the chisel and hammer and, uh, you know, like, he destroyed the sculptures, which shows that male form might inspire lust. So do you, can you shed some light on it? So the I, destruction, okay. can, you, can you help me, Eleonora? Um, or maybe, yeah, but actually, yeah, can, you, can you write this? Can you, can you text us in, in, the, <laughs> in, the, in the chat? Because I had it. Yes, yeah, like that would be okay. Like I'm writing in the chat. Uh, it, okay. It's perfect. So, so in, in the meantime, I, I just want to ask, ask to Octavio, um, what is your prefer um, the, the, the sculpture that you show us, the sculpture that you prefer and why um, in, in a technical way or in an aesthetic way? So getting one, one uh, my favorite yeah. is is uh, well it's difficult to say one favorite but I really uh, at this point I really focus into uh, Bernini into Bernini now, I don't put it here because Bernini for me is, is a new challenge that you know every period I try to take one uh master and try to get into the technique that he uses so for example um i i show the process that i get for the for jambologna you know so maybe in a couple months i get more information about bernini but in the case of uh, the idea of bernini was uh as usual the david because 
everyone, every master get a representation of David, you know, and the, how he represent the movement in the David Bernini. No? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I have a very beautiful your presentation. Thank you. Can you share some light about the Great Constriction by Pius? Ah, Pius Nine, you know, and the relationship between sculpture and manieries. I don't know if you know this. This art. Oh, castration. I mean, by Pius. Pius Nine, I think. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I, it's the first time that I see. So, yeah, the il braghettone, vuoi dire, no? Ah, maybe, ah, maybe, yeah. Okay, il braghettone, yeah, like, yeah. in Italian, because, yeah, exactly. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, exactly, the nudity, you know, the problem of the religious and the nudity, it was yeah. difficult. I'm talking about Bernini, because recently I, I was really deep into that, because imagine Bernini tried to make a representation of naked bodies, female sensuality, mm -hmm. and next to him have the papa. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> yeah. so, but but cool. he was really smart because he tried to really, really direct it into the religious, into the representation of something really pure. Because, you know, small genitals, like representation of purity, because it's something like the answer to the Greeks, they represented like that, no? And even that try to don't pay attention in that part because the humans needs to represent himself or on other things, not for the genitals. But even the pub and the other um, religious force, I try to mention like that, religious force try to cover that completely, no? So it's terrible because even uh, these poor artists, imagine like you get the commission, hey, you need to cover that. Yeah. So that is the reason that one artist was named Braghetone, because it's like, you know, uh, underwearing, you know, the, <laughs> all the, all these um, magnificence of these uh, masterpieces. And yeah, exactly, you know, so it's terrible. And okay, and the other part is the relation between sculpture and mannerism. So I think that that was the first, the first way like the, the person consider, okay, I follow these steps, I follow these rules, but then, then I break it in my own way. So uh, for me, everything start there, the contemporary artists now, because, you know, in these days, manner is, is okay. I have the rules, but I try to push it a little more so no one say nothing. Then all the representation, artistic representation, doing the completely the opposite. No, they say no. I'm gonna destroy the forms. I'm gonna destroy completely what they made it because it's the the re refute the that rules. So for me, manner is sculpting is practically. The, the first, like the rule start to bending. Yeah. And then the others practically break it, re-glue it, build it, twist it. <laughs> Everything is art, I know, but I think that the life is rules and we need to try to follow those. The benefit is that you can create your own rules. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Dan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Like a thank very you. beautiful presentation. Really loved it. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you and thank you, Octavio, really. Um, well, so, okay, um, okay Octavio, if, if you want to, to text on the chat your contacts, if you, so if they have questions or curiosity or, okay, they, they can contact you, okay? In the chat. So I don't know if you have another questions for um, other um, speakers and I just um, wanted to make a little question very fast to Ivo. So <laughs> yeah it will just um, what okay what, what is the characteristic that uh, fascinated you more of the upcycling because you started to make upcycling from collage i think 
So what is the, the aspect of the upcycling that uh, has more charm for you? Yeah, for me, it, it, it is really the chaotic part, you know, like you start like, because I have, I have really a strong ac academic knowing about art, you know, like drawing, painting, and, and in like looking in your reality and uh, start bringing some materials, new materials that can be plastic, then can be textile and start using that like an elements or an ingredient for your arts really makes something different. And from there, uh, it's like a new possibility of expression can start. So it's like really looking from the materials to have new possibility of expression that are really different from the past because the material is always changing. That. Yeah, yeah to, to go over the materials of the, the simple paintings and yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh okay yeah great the chat is is very active so okay i don't know if you have questions for ivo or oh, i i can uh, make a fast very fast question for rosanna because you talk like me of restoration and so you you talk about the mummies that you studied so just a little a little question for you so um, the kind of cleaning that you that you did on the, on your on the mummies uh, i think it is very it's, it's not a deep cleaning it's very simple cleaning no i i, I cannot hear you now it's fine yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry uh, i forgot the microphone <laughs> so uh, yes so uh, it is not really a deep cleaning it's only to uh, to remove the the dust and uh, so the other things like um, so dead insect and uh, it is very an operation that is very very soft you can imagine because so our mummies are uh, very fragile. And um, so I remember we, um, we use so something very, very, very soft. And um, so for the clothing as well, we, uh, we try to, um, to wash them with, uh, with natural soaps, you know, and uh, so putting, uh, dr so dr uh, drying in, uh, in the room, not there directly in the sun, no, or, or in the dryer, <laughs> or no. so together with our clothes, so washing together, no, it was so something very, very soft. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, so. <laughs> Well, if, if um, you have questions for Rosanna, so I I saw that you put the contact of Octavio. So Ivo, if you want to text your contacts on, in the chat, you can so they can contact you for any questions or curiosity. You can write in the in the chat. So I okay. So I I saw that. Yeah, Aditya <laughs> wants to, to follow Octavio, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. So, okay. So I don't know if you have questions or... Okay, great. And, uh, okay, so the Jaguar Studio, you put some contacts of Jaguar Studio. Yeah, yeah okay, okay, right. So, so okay. I don't know, Mohammed. I... I, I I hope that you, you like this conference. I just wanted to put um, some topics about uh, restoration and art in Italy. So I, I hope that, <laughs> that you are happy about this, uh, about this appointment. I just want to really thank you, the speakers, uh, because they 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 are beautiful. They they was very professional, and uh, the topics are very interesting. And uh, I really thank you, and thank you the, the, and thank the public, uh, <laughs> the the public of today, 
because you are very interested to us. So, okay. So I don't know, Mohammed, where is Mohammed? I, I lost it. I lost him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so maybe I, I don't know if he, there are another, other questions. Um, so I, okay. Okay. You, do, you, do you want to say something, Mohammed? Oh, so you are the boss of this session. I think that's uh, you, what you have said that that is more than enough. But on the, but I would uh, add to it a little bit that uh, uh, the uh, presentations were really uh, very diversified and very uh, uh, interesting. So uh, we knew about recycling and. Uh, I first time came to know that there is up the down cycling and there is up cycling and uh, definitely that economy uh, cycling. So, so this uh, uh, was very much interesting. I will, thanks to Evo. So he has uh, shared with us a very good uh, topic and also that. Uh, yeah, we, we lost you. Mm, we have lost you. Okay, maybe for the connection. Okay, maybe for the connection. Okay, so if you are agree, I can, ah, hello, Shivani. <laughs> so if you, thank you for Dan also. And I, I saw also an Italian Stefano, but maybe, yeah, he doesn't, okay. Hello, hello, Shivani. Uh, so maybe, Hi. Hi. Uh, ah, Chris, Chris uh, said to us, Chris Kenny, um, yeah, was started from USA, and uh, ah, yeah, he appreciated a lot the presentation of Rosanna on Mummies. But yeah, Chris Kenny, I have the contact of Chris on Facebook. Uh, uh, okay, so maybe I can, maybe I could stop the the register yeah to to record to record but we we can continue to, to talk here so i can stop the to record okay thank you chris for appreciating okay <laughs>